Chapter 3 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Cosby. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 3 it was manifest that i was now in a country where the life of a black man was no more regarded than that of an ox except as far as the man was worth the more money in the market on all the plantations that we passed there was a want of livestock of every description except slaves and they were deplorably abundant the fields were destitute of everything that deserved the name of grass and not a spear of clover was anywhere visible. The few cattle that existed were browsing on the boughs of the trees in the woods. Everything betrayed a scarcity of the means of supplying the slaves, who cultivated the fast cotton fields, with a sufficiency of food. We traveled this day more than thirty miles, and crossed the Catawba River in the afternoon, on the bottoms of which I saw, for the first time, fields of rice growing in swamps covered with water. Causeways were raised through the lowlands in which the rice grew, and on which the road was formed on which we traveled. These rice fields, or rather swamps, had in my eyes a beautiful appearance. The rice was nearly two feet in height above the water, and of a vivid green color covering a large space of at least a hundred acres had it not been for the water which appeared stagnant and sickly and swarmed with frogs and thousands of snakes it would have been as fine a sight as one need wish to look upon after leaving the low grounds along the river we again entered plantations of cotton which lined the roads on both sides relieved here and there by cornfields and potato patches we stopped for the night at a small tavern and our master said we were within a day's journey of columbia we here again received boiled rice for supper without salt or any kind of seasoning a pint was allotted to each person which we greedily devoured having had no dinner to-day save an allowance of corn cakes with the fat of about five pounds of bacon extracted by frying in which we dipped our bread i slept soundly after this day's march the fatigues of the body having for once overcome the agitations of the mind the next day which was if my recollection is accurate the ninth of june was the last of our journey before our company separated and we were on the road before the stars had disappeared from the sky our breakfast this morning consisted of bacon soup a dish composed of corn meal boiled in water with a small piece of bacon to give the soup a taste of meat for dinner we had boiled indian peas with a small allowance of bacon this was the first time that we had received two rations of meat in the same day on the whole journey and some of our party were much surprised at the kindness of our master but i had no doubt that his object was to make us look fat and hearty to enable him to obtain better prices for us at columbia at supper this night we had corn mush in large wooden trays with melted lard to dip the mush in before eating it. We might have reached Columbia this day if we had continued our march, but we stopped at least an hour before sunset about three miles from town at the house of a man who supported the double character of planter and keeper of a house of entertainment, for I learned from his slaves that their master considered it disreputable to be called a tavern keeper and would not put up a sign, although he received pay of such persons as lodged with him. His house was a frame building, 
weather boarded with pine boards but had no plastering within the furniture corresponded with the house which contained it and was both scanty and mean consisting of pine tables and wooden chairs with bottoms made of corn husks the house was only one story high and all the rooms six or seven in number parlor bedrooms and kitchen were on the first floor as the weather was warm and the windows open i had an opportunity of looking into the sleeping rooms of the family as i walked round the house which i was permitted freely to do the beds and their furniture answered well to the chairs and tables yet in the large front room i observed on an old-fashioned sideboard a great quantity of glassware of various descriptions with two or three dozen silver spoons a silver tea urn and several knives and forks with silver handles in the corner of this room stood a bed with gaudy red curtains with figures of lions elephants naked negroes and other representations of african scenery the master of the house was not at home when we arrived but came in from the field shortly afterwards he met my master with the cordiality of an old friend though he had never seen him before said he was happy to see him at his house and that the greatest pleasure he enjoyed was derived from the entertainment of such gentlemen as thought proper to visit his house that he was always glad to see strangers and more especially gentlemen who were adding so much to the wealth and population of carolina as those merchants who imported servants from the north he then observed that he had never seen a finer lot of property pass his house than we were and that any gentleman who brought such a stock of hands into the country was a public benefactor and entitled to the respect and gratitude of every friend of the south he assured my master that he was happy to see him at his house and that if he thought proper to remain a few days with him it would be his chief business to introduce him to the gentlemen of the neighborhood who would all be glad to become acquainted with a merchant of his respectability in the state of maryland my master had been called a negro buyer or georgia trader sometimes a negro driver but here i found that he was elevated to the rank of merchant and a merchant of the first order too for it was very clear that in the opinion of the landlord no branch of trade was more honorable than the traffic in us poor slaves our master observed that he had a mind to remain here a short time and try what kind of market columbia would present for the sale of his lot of servants and that he would make his house his home until he had ascertained what could be done in town and what demand there was in the neighborhood for servants we were not called slaves by these men who talked of selling us and of the price we would bring with as little compunction of conscience as they would have talked of the sale of so many mules it is the custom throughout all the slave-holding states amongst people of fashion never to speak of their negroes as slaves but always as servants but i had never before met with the keeper of a public house in the country who had arrived at this degree of refinement i had been accustomed to hear this order of men and indeed the greater number of white people speak of the people of color as niggers we remained at this place more than two weeks i presume because my master found it cheaper to keep us here than in town or perhaps because he supposed we might recover from the hardships of our journey more speedily in the country as it was here that my real acquaintance with south carolina commenced i have noted with more particularity the incidents that occurred than i otherwise should have done this family was composed of the husband wife three daughters all young women and two sons 
one of whom appeared to be about twenty and the other perhaps seventeen years old they had nine slaves in all one very old man quite crooked with years and labor two men of middle age one lad perhaps sixteen one woman with three children the oldest about seven and a young girl of twelve or fourteen the farm or plantation they lived on contained about one hundred and fifty acres of cleared land sandy and the greater part of it poor as was proved by the stinted growth of the cotton at the time of our arrival at this house i saw no persons about it except the four ladies the mother and her three daughters the husband being in the field as noticed above according to the orders of my master i had taken the saddle from his horse and put him in a stable and it was not until after the first salutations of the new landlord to my master were over that he seemed to think of asking him whether he had come on foot on horseback or in a coach he at length however turned suddenly and asked him with an air of surprise where he had left his horses and carriage my master said he had no carriage that he traveled on horseback and that his horse was in the stable the landlord then apologized for the trouble he must have had in having his horse put away himself and said that at this season of the year the planters were so hurried by their crops and found so much difficulty in keeping down the grass that they were generally obliged to keep all their servants in the field that for his part he had been compelled to put his coachman and even the waiting maids of his daughters into the cotton fields and that at this time his family were without servants a circumstance that had never happened before for my part said he i have always prided myself on bringing up my family well and can say that although i do not live in so fine a house as some of the other planters of carolina yet my children are as great ladies and gentlemen as any in the state not one of them has ever had to do a day's work yet and as long as i live never shall i sent two of my daughters to charleston last summer and they were there three months and i intend to send the youngest there this summer they have all learned to dance here in columbia where i sent them two quarters to a frenchman and he made me pay pretty well for it they went to the same dancing school with the daughters of wade hampton and colonel fitzhugh i am determined that they shall never marry any but gentlemen of the first character and i know they will always follow my advice in matters of this kind they are prudent and sensible girls and are not going to do as major pollock's daughter did this spring who ran away with a georgia cracker who brought a drove of cattle for sale from the indian country and who had not a nigger in the world he stayed with me some time and wished to have something to say to my second daughter but the thing would not do here he stopped short in his narrative and seeming to muse a moment said to his guest i presume as you travel alone you have no family no replied my master i am a single man i thought so by your appearance said the loquacious landlord and i shall be glad to introduce you to my family this evening my sons are two as fine fellows as there are in all carolina my oldest boy is lieutenant in the militia and in the same company that marched with general marion in the war he was on the point of fighting a duel last winter with young mccorkle in columbia but the matter was settled between them you will see him this evening when he returns from the quiet party a quiet party of young bucks meet once every week about two miles from this and as i wish my sons to keep the best company they both attend it there is to be a cock fight there this afternoon and my youngest son edmund has the finest cock in this country he is one of the true game blood the real dominica game breed and i sent to charleston for his gaffs 
there's a bet of ten dollars aside between my son's cock and the one belonging to young blaney the son of major blaney young blaney is a hot-headed young blood and has been concerned in three duels though i believe he never fought but one but i know edmund will not take a word from him and it will be well if he and his cock do not both get well licked here the conversation was arrested by the sound of horses feet on the road and in the next instant two young men rode up at a gallop mounted on lean-looking horses one of the riders carrying a pole on his shoulder with a gamecock in a net bag tied to one end of it on perceiving them the landlord exclaimed with an oath there's two lads of spirit stranger and if you will allow me the liberty of asking you your name i will introduce you to them at the suggestion of his name my master seemed to hesitate a little but after a moment's pause said they call me mcgiffin sir my name is hulig sir replied the landlord and i am very happy to be acquainted with you mr mcgiffin at the same time shaking him by the hand and introducing his two sons who were by this time at the door this was the first time i had ever heard the name of my master although i had been with him five weeks i had never seen him before the day on which he seized and bound me in maryland and as he took me away immediately i did not hear his name at the time the people who assisted to fetter me either from accident or design omitted to name him and after we commenced our journey he had maintained so much distant reserve and austerity of manner towards us all that no one ventured to ask him his name we had called him nothing but master and the various persons at whose houses we had stopped on our way knew as little of his name as we did we had frequently been asked the name of our master and perhaps had not always obtained credence when we said we did not know it throughout the whole journey until after we were released from our irons he had forbidden us to converse together beyond a few words in relation to our temporary condition and wants and as he was with us all day and never slept out of hearing of us at night he rigidly enforced his edict of silence i presume that the reason of this prohibition of all conversation was to prevent us from devising plans of escape but he had imposed as rigid a silence on himself as was enforced upon us and after having passed from maryland to south carolina in his company i knew no more of my master than that he knew how to keep his secrets guard his slaves and make a close bargain i had never heard him speak of his home or family and therefore had concluded that he was an unmarried man and an adventurer who felt no more attachment for one place than another and whose residence was not very well settled but from the large sums of money which he must have been able to command and carry with him to the north to enable him to purchase so large a number of slaves i had no doubt that he was a man of consequence and consideration in the place from whence he came in maryland i had always observed that men who were the owners of large stocks of negroes were not averse to having publicity given to their names and that the possession of this species of property even there gave its owner more vanity and egotism than fell to the lot of the holders of any other kind of estate and in truth my subsequent experience proved that without the possession of slaves no man could ever arrive at or hope to rise to any honorable station in society yet my master seemed to take no pride in having at his disposal the lives of so many human beings he never spoke to us in words of either pity or hatred and never spoke of us except to order us to be fed or watered as he would have directed the same offices to be performed for so many horses or to inquire where the best prices could be obtained for us 
he regarded us only as objects of traffic and the materials of his commerce and although he had lived several years in carolina and georgia and had there exercised the profession of an overseer he regarded the southern planters as no less the subjects of trade and speculation than the slaves he sold to them as will appear in the sequel it was to this man that the landlord introduced his two sons and upon whom he was endeavoring to impose a belief that he was the head of a family which took rank with those of the first planters of the district the ladies of the household though i had seen them in the kitchen when i walked round the house had not yet presented themselves to my master nor indeed were they in a condition to be seen anywhere but in the apartment they occupied at the time the young gentleman gave a very gasconading account of the court party and cockfight from which they had just returned and according to their version of the affair it might have been an assemblage of at least half the military officers of the state for all the persons of whom they spoke were captains majors and colonels the eldest said he had won two bowls of punch at quartz and the youngest whose cock had been victor in the battle on which ten dollars were staked vaunted much of the qualities of his bird and supported his veracity by numerous oaths and reiterated appeals to his brother for the truth of his assertions both these young men were so much intoxicated that they with difficulty maintained an erect posture in walking by this time the sun was going down and i observed two female slaves a woman and girl approaching the house on the side of the kitchen from the cotton field they were coming home to prepare supper for the family the ladies whom i had seen in the kitchen not having been there for the purpose of performing the duties appropriate to that station but having sought it as a place of refuge from the sight of my master who had approached the front of their dwelling silently and so suddenly as not to permit them to gain the foot of the stairway in the large front room without being seen by him to whose view they by no means wished to expose themselves before they had visited their toilets about dark the supper was ready in the large room and as it had two fronts one of which looked into the yard where my companions and i had been permitted to seat ourselves and had an opportunity of seeing by the light of the candle all that was done within and of hearing all that was said the ladies four in number had entered the room before the gentleman and when the latter came in my master was introduced by the landlord to his wife and daughters by the name and title of colonel mcgiffin which at that time impressed me with the belief that he was really an officer and that he had disclosed this circumstance without my knowledge but i afterwards perceived that in the south it is deemed respectful to address a stranger by the title of colonel or major or general if his appearance will warrant the association of so high a rank with his name my master had declared his intention of becoming the inmate of this family for some time and no pains seemed to be spared on their part to impress upon his mind the high opinion that they entertained of the dignity of the owner of fifty slaves the possession of so large a number of human creatures being in carolina a certificate of character which entitles its bearer to enter whatever society he may choose to select without anything more being known of his birth his life or reputation the man who owns fifty servants must needs be a gentleman amongst the higher ranks and the owner of half a hundred niggers is a sort of nobleman amongst the low the ignorant and the vulgar the mother and three daughters whose appearance when i saw them in the kitchen 
would have warranted the conclusion that they had just risen from bed without having time to adjust their dress, were now gaily, if not neatly, attired. And the two female slaves, who had come from the field at sundown to cook the supper, now waited at the table. The landlord talked much of his crops, his plantation and slaves, and of the distinguished families who exchanged visits with his own. But my master took very little part in the conversation of the evening, and appeared disposed to maintain the air of mystery which had hitherto invested his character. After it was quite dark, the slaves came in from the cotton field, and taking little notice of us, went into the kitchen, and each, taking thence a pint of corn, proceeded to a little mill, which was nailed to a post in the yard, and there commenced the operation of grinding meal for their suppers, which were afterwards to be prepared by baking the meal into cakes at the fire. The woman, who was the mother of the three small children, was permitted to grind her allowance of corn first, and after her came the old man, and the others in succession. After the corn was converted into meal, each one kneaded it up with cold water into a thick dough, and raking away the ashes from a small space on the kitchen hearth, placed the dough rolled up in green leaves in the hollow, and covering it with hot embers, left it to be baked into bread, which was done in about half an hour. These loaves constituted the only supper of the slaves belonging to this family, for I observed that the two women who had waited at the table after the supper of the white people was disposed of also came with their corn to the meal on the post and ground their allowance like the others. They had not been permitted to taste even the fragments of the meal that they had cooked for their masters and mistresses. It was eleven o'clock before these people had finished their supper of cakes, and several of them, especially the younger of the two lads, were so overpowered with toil and sleep that they had to be roused from their slumbers when their cakes were done to devour them. We had for our supper tonight a pint of boiled rice to each person, and a small quantity of stale and very rancid butter from the bottom of an old keg or firkin which contained about two pounds, the remnant of that which once filled it. We boiled the rice ourselves in a large iron kettle, and as our master now informed us that we were to remain here some time, many of us determined to avail ourselves of this season of respite from our toils, to wash our clothes, and free our persons from the vermin which had appeared amongst our party several weeks before, and now begun to be extremely tormenting. As we were not allowed any soap, we were obliged to resort to the use of a very fine and unctuous kind of clay, resembling fuller's earth, but of a yellow color, which was found on the margin of a small swamp near the house. This was the first time that I had ever heard of clay being used for the purpose of washing clothes, but I often availed myself of this resource afterwards whilst I was a slave in the South. We wet our clothes, then rubbed this clay all over the garments, and by scouring it out in warm water with our hands, the cloth, whether of woolen or cotton or of linen texture, was entirely clean. We subjected our persons to the same process, and in this way freed our camp from the host of enemies that had been generated in the course of our journey. This washing consumed the whole of the first day of our residence on the plantation of Mr. Hulig. We all lay the first night in a shed or summer kitchen, standing behind the house, and a few yards from it a place in which the slaves of the plantation washed their clothes, 
and passed their Sundays in warm weather when they did not work. But as this place was quite too small to accommodate our party, or indeed to contain us, without crowding us together in such a manner as to endanger our health, we were removed, the morning after our arrival, to an old, decayed frame building about one hundred yards from the house, which had been erected, as I learned, for a cotton gin, but into which its possessor, for want of means, I presume, had never introduced the machinery of the gin. This building was near forty feet square, was without any other floor than the earth, and neither doors nor windows to close the openings which had been left for the admission of those who entered it. We were told that in this place the cotton of the plantation was deposited in the picking season, as it was brought from the field, until it could be removed to a neighboring plantation, where there was a gin to divest it of its seeds. Here we took our temporary abode, men and women, promiscuously. Our provisions, whilst we remained here, were regularly distributed to us, and our daily allowance to each person consisted of a pint of corn, a pint of rice, and about three or four pounds of butter, such as we had received on the night of our arrival, divided amongst us in small pieces from the point of a table knife. The rice we boiled in the iron kettle. We ground our corn at the little mill on the post in the kitchen, and converted the meal into bread in the manner we had been accustomed to at home, sometimes on the hearth and sometimes before the fire on a hoe. The butter was given us as an extraordinary ration to strengthen and recruit us after our long march and give us a healthy and expert appearance at the time of our future sale. We had no beds of any kind to sleep on, but each one was provided with a blanket which had been the companion of our travels. We were left entirely at liberty to go out or in when we pleased, and no watch was kept over us either by night or day. Our master had removed us so far from our native country that he supposed it impossible for any of us ever to escape from him and surmount all the obstacles that lay between us and our former homes. He went away immediately after we were established in our new lodgings and remained absent until the second evening about sundown when he returned, came into our shed, sat down on a block of wood in the midst of us and asked if any one had been sick, if we had got our clothes clean, and if we had been supplied with an allowance of rice, corn, and butter. After satisfying himself upon these points, he told us that we were now at liberty to run away if we chose to do so. But if we made the attempt, we should most certainly be retaken and subjected to the most terrible punishment. I never flog, said he. My practice is to cat haul, and if you run away and I catch you again, as I surely shall do, and give you one cat hauling, you will never run away again nor attempt it. I did not then understand the import of cat hauling, but in after times became well acquainted with its signification. We remained in this place nearly two weeks, during which time our allowance of food was not varied and was regularly given to us. We were not required to do any work, and I had liberty and leisure to walk about the plantation and make such observations as I could upon the new state of things around me. Gentlemen and ladies came every day to look at us with the view of becoming our purchasers and we were examined with minute care as to our ages, former occupations, and capacity of performing labor. Our persons were inspected, and more especially the hands were scrutinized, 
to see if all the fingers were perfect and capable of the quick motions necessary in picking cotton. Our master only visited us once a day, and sometimes he remained absent two days, so that he seldom met any of those who came to see us. But whenever it so happened that he did meet them, he laid aside his silence and became very talkative, and even animated in his conversation, extolling our good qualities and averring that he had purchased some of us of one colonel and others of another general in Virginia, that he could by no means have procured us had it not been that, in some instances, our masters had ruined themselves and were obliged to sell us to save their families from ruin, and in others that our owners were dead, their estates deeply in debt, and we had been sold at public sale, by which means he had become possessed of us. He said our habits were unexceptionable, our characters good, that there was not one among us all who had ever been known to run away or steal anything from our former masters. I observed that running away and stealing from his master were regarded as the highest crimes of which a slave could be guilty, but I heard no questions asked concerning our propensity to steal from other people besides our masters, and I afterwards learned that this was not always regarded as a very high crime by the owner of a slave, provided he would perpetrate the theft so adroitly as not to be detected in it. We were severally asked by our visitors if we would be willing to live with them, if they would purchase us, to which we generally replied in the affirmative. But our owner declined all the offers that were made for us, upon the ground that we were too poor, looked too bad to be sold at present, and that in our condition he could not expect to get a fair value for us. One evening, when our master was with us, a thin, sallow-looking man rode up to the house, and alighting from his horse, came to us and told him that he had come to buy a boy that he wished to get a good field hand and would pay a good price for him. I never saw a human countenance that expressed more of the evil passions of the heart than did that of this man, and his conversation corresponded with his physiognomy. Every sentence of his language was accompanied with an oath of the most vulgar profanity and his eyes appeared to me to be the index of a soul as cruel as his visage was disgusting and repulsive. After looking at us for some time, this wretch singled me out as the object of his choice, and coming up to me, asked me how I would like him for a master. In my heart I detested him but a slave is often afraid to speak the truth and divulge all he feels, so with myself in this instance, as it was doubtful whether I might not fall into his hands and be subject to the violence of his temper. I told him that if he was a good master, as every gentleman ought to be, I should be willing to live with him. He appeared satisfied with my answer, and turning to my master, said he would get a high price for me. I can, said he, by going to Charleston, buy as many guinea negroes as I please for two hundred dollars each. But as I like this fellow, I will give you four hundred for him. This offer struck terror into my heart for I knew it was as much as was generally given for the best and ablest slaves, and I expected that it would immediately be accepted as my price, and that I should be at once consigned to the hands of this man of whom I had formed so abhorrent an opinion. To my surprise and satisfaction, however, my master made no reply to the proposition, but stood for a moment with one hand raised to his face and his forefinger on his nose 
and then turning suddenly to me said go into the house i shall not sell you today it was my business to obey the order of departure and as i went beyond the sound of their voices i could not understand the purport of the conversation which followed between these two traffickers in human blood but after a parley of about a quarter of an hour the hated stranger started abruptly away and going to the road mounted his horse and rode off at a gallop banishing himself and my fears together i did not see my master again this evening and when i came out of our barracks in the morning although it was scarcely daylight i saw him standing near one corner of the building with his head inclined towards the wall evidently listening to catch any sounds within he ordered me to go and feed his horse and have him saddled for him by sunrise about an hour afterwards he came to the stable in his riding dress and told me that he should remove us all to columbia in a few days he then rode away and did not return until the third day afterwards. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tom Cosby